the NHL has to do something about how the Department of Player Safety is functioning right now. We're going to talk about that on today's Locked on Blue Jackets. Your Locked on Blue Jackets, your daily podcast on the Columbus Blue Jackets, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Blue Jackets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am, as always, your host, Jay Foster. Uh, just me today, no Hayden. He'll be back tomorrow. Uh, but I'm here to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly about your favorite team and mine, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone for making this your first listen of the day every day. Locked On Blue Jackets is free and available on all podcast platforms, on YouTube, and on Sirius XM. I also let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code LOCKDOWNNHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Now, we have to talk about the Gabranson-Nick Cousins incident. Um, Gabranson got suspended for one game uh, after after result, after um, what he did in the game against the Florida Panthers, but... To explain that, we have to go back. We have to explain uh, what happened a little bit earlier in that game, which is uh, Nick Cousins sends Eric Branson face first into the dasher behind the penalty box, uh, behind the the goal, excuse me, uh, gets given a major, which is then reviewed and dropped down to a minor, um, which I disagree with, but um, entirely unsurprised by... um, for a couple of reasons. One is that NHL officiating is so inconsistent that if I think something is going to happen, then generally what happens is the opposite of that. Um, the second thing is um, Cabranson goes down for a couple of seconds and then gets back up and immediately starts throwing punches. And I genuinely do think that's why it was reduced. If Cabranson stays down, then I think that that stays a major. Um, and if that stays a major, then... Uh, what like what happens is uh, likely not what happened, which is um, Erica Branson decided to. If the refs weren't going to punish Nick Cousins, then he was going to punish Nick Cousins. So, as uh, soon as they were on the ice again together, uh, Branson just like tries to pile dive Cousins into the ice. Uh, Cousins wants no part of this. Kind of curls up and decides that he's not going to fight. So Eric Branson gets hit with, I think, 27 minutes of penalties, uh, including two minutes for instigating, five minutes for fighting, and two 10-minute misconducts, uh, one for instigating and one a game misconduct. So he's done for the night. Blue Jackets have seven minutes of penalties to kill off, um, which they almost do, by the way. They killed off like six and a half minutes of the seven-minute penalty kill, which uh, good for them. You know, that was a really strong... Um, seven minutes out of out of them but Gabranson gets a call from the department of player safety and gets suspended for one game which frankly is is less than i assumed i thought he would get at least two um he's not a repeat offender he was suspended for one game i think in 2017 um for for boarding someone i believe is is what the the suspension was for so you know he he has had a clean, a clean sheet since then, uh, now, suspended for one game, um, which, in a vacuum, I'm fine with. That probably deserves one or two games of, of suspension. However, my issue lies with the fact that Nick Cousins gets no supplemental uh, discipline, um, not even a fine, uh, not anything basically um he sits his two minutes and then he's he's done and like it's so frustrating because i i just i don't i want consistency from the league like that's that's what i think that's what a lot of people want you know there's a lot of talk about how yeah gabranson deserved it and it's not his fault it's not Nick Cousins' fault that the referees didn't didn't punish him appropriately, blah, blah, blah. But, like, 
I feel like you see the same hit like three times a week and you get three different responses. And is that because it's different referees? Is that because the rules aren't clear enough? Like, I don't know what it is at this point. And it's so, so frustrating because players have no idea what to expect. You know, um, you get plays like what happened with, with Nick Cousins, who uh, he got two minutes. Uh, Eric Robinson boarded someone in against Montreal, I believe it was. They got five out of a game for it, you know? Um, and then on the flip side, you've got cases like um, David Perron, who in the aftermath of Dolan Larkin getting knocked unconscious by um, what I genuinely think was bad luck. Uh, just, he got hit in the back by Macho Joseph, and then on his way down, he got hit in the front by, I think, Parker Kelly. Um, David Brown comes along, cross-checks uh, Archum, I believe his name is, uh, Archum Zub, in the face, gets six games for that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if David Perron is considered a repeat offender or not, but... Consistency. That's I think that's what lots and lots of people want, is, is consistency. So how how do you get consistency in this league? It's it's difficult because it's so fast because a lot of the things that referees do is split second decisions, you know? Um I like that they've introduced this ability to review um to review major penalties because sometimes I think a penalty is is a penalty and sometimes it's not and i like that they have the ability to review them um i think that all penalties should probably be reviewed if you know even if it's one one rewatch okay cool called the right penalty on the right person let's go or if you know you call and we we see a lot of i feel like it's a lot of tripping penalties get called and it's just guys losing their edge or the opposite happened. They think a guy has lost their edge and um, they were actually tripped. I know that people are resistant to bringing new new ways to quote unquote slow down the game. I know people get really annoyed about like offside reviews and goaltender interference reviews and stuff, but maybe they need to review more things. Maybe they need to re educate referees. Like, we're going to talk about a couple more options. Um, for that in in a second here on Locked On Blue Jackets because I have some thoughts about officiating. Uh, so we'll kind of get more into that in just a second. First, though, I'm going to tell you guys about Sleeper because we are almost a third of the way through the NHL season. Uh, someone could score 50 goals this season. Someone is going to hoist the Stanley Cup. It could be the Blue Jackets, but it's probably not going to be. But what you could do is win big by playing Daily Fantasy Hockey on Sleeper, the official Daily Fantasy app of the Lockdown NHL Network. They're our number one choice for Daily Fantasy Sports, and especially Daily Fantasy Hockey, because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in Daily Fantasy contests. Uh, I, I really like this app. I think it's, it's a lot of fun. It's easy to use. Um, they've got NFL, NBA, MLB, college football, all on Sleeper. And all you have to do is pick whether guys like McDavid, Ovechkin, Crosby, McKinnon will record more or less than their Sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more in a given game. Entries can be made in under a minute. And if you correctly predict the outcome of eight player stats, you're going to win 100 times your money. You heard me right there. You can win 100 times your money. By playing daily fantasy hockey with Sleeper, so start paying attention, nail your picks, so you can start winning big. Use promo code locked on NHL, and you'll get up to a one hundred dollar match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. It's code locked on NHL. See Sleeper's terms of use for details and locational availability. All right, I want to talk a little bit more about officiating because I think there are ways that they can improve what's happening right now um because i know gary bettman loves to say that the nhl has the best referees in the world factually incorrect like quantifiably incorrect you know you could you could point to half a dozen incidents this week alone that 
have shown like severe flaws in the officiating system of of the NHL. And like this is not even getting into the Department of Player Safety, which I want to talk about um in, in a minute, but the refs need it, like something needs to change. And I've seen a couple of options for this. And one I really like is have your four men on the ice and then have a guy up in press box, wherever, watching the game from above because things get missed. Things things get missed. Things get called that shouldn't. Things that don't get called should. Um, and I think that's like that's the easiest way to, is to go to a five-man system, have someone, even someone like watching on TV in Toronto, and they can flag, you know, hey, this was called, this wasn't called. Um, the problem is, do you allow this person to stop the game? You know, and if so, how do they contact the refs on the ice, get them to blow the whistle? Like, what, like, I, I don't quite know how that shakes out, but like, that's, that's an option. Um, the other option is, I don't remember which league it is. Is it the, the, the NBA, maybe? They make their officials available to media after the game. I don't think this will stop all of the nonsense that goes on with the refs, but if the referees had to justify why they were doing things to media after the game, instead of just calling what they want and then moving on, like you might see a reluctance to just kind of call random stuff and a reluctance to not call things to like let them play for example because like yeah let them play but also your job is to manage the game and kind of going back to the Gabranson thing if they call that major penalty on Nick Cousins the Gabranson incident likely doesn't happen you know if you call the initial penalty the retaliation likely doesn't happen and i know that refs don't see everything but like and so you know it's it's a lot of times and i've seen this a lot in watching games like live in person um with with my job over here in in the uk is refs will almost always cause call the retaliation penalty because what will happen is they'll see movement out of the corner of their eye which is usually like the initial slash or cross check or whatever they'll turn to look they'll catch the guy doing the retaliation um that will also probably, if you have a ref up above, that will um, cut back on that as well, I think, because if they called the second penalty, then, you know, the first one, I assume the guys will be able, the guy up above will be like, hey, the other guy hit him first, send them both. Um, so, like, retaliation penalties are a, are a big thing, and a lot of that, again, is game management. You know, if someone doesn't get called for something earlier in the game, then, hey, They'll do it again. They'll push the limits. They'll be like, right, if I get away with that, what else can I get away with? Or the other team will be like, well, if they're going to run our players, then we'll run their players. You know, and it turns into this cycle of what happened against Florida, which is Branson felt like he wasn't, he felt like he was justified in um, beating the tar out of Nick Cousins. And like, I don't condone. Walker Branson did because there's a big, like, there's a really big thing in the NHL specifically, I feel like, which is this concept of two wrongs make a right. You know, if you do something bad to me, I'm going to do something bad to you. And that makes everything better. And like, I don't condone Walker Branson did, but I understand why he did it. And I don't fully blame him for this because if the refs had done their goddamn jobs, they wouldn't be in this situation. You know, Nick Cousins should have been, it should have been five in a game. Um, and that's, that's that, um, there's, there's something else that I kind of want to cover here, which is, I think something I've covered on the podcast before, and if not on the podcast, they're definitely on Twitter, but it's really interesting to me that high sticks and trips are the only penalties that are called, like, regardless of intent. I feel like if a player accidentally hits someone, like if they're like, oh, it, it was incidental contact for example. Um, that's not a penalty. I feel like hits to the head should be automatic five in a game, regardless of intent, regardless of like whether they were like, regardless of whether they were trying to injure, regardless of whether it was an accident, like 
if you want to get hits to the head out of the game, which I think a lot of people should want, you have to punish the accidents as well as the intentional ones, because otherwise you have this gray area of, well, he didn't mean to do it, so we'll let it go this time. And, you know, it's opens up this, well, I didn't mean to hit him, or it opens up this weird gray area. And I think that's a problem as well. Like, there's, I have a lot of problems with the way that officiating is, is done in the NHL, and you either have to call the rule book or not. And it feels like not is is the the answer that most um the most officials go for and i get it they've been doing it for a long time if they called everything in the rule book nothing would ever get done in the sport but you've got to like you've got to have something here that that's like you have to do something about what's going on right now because this is the third incident of like retribution um that happened this this week you know and then you look at david perron getting six games for uh Archam Zub. you look at gabranson getting one game for nick cousins and then uh ryan strome has potentially ended kyle connor's season in uh in the ducks winnipeg game and that's what we're going to talk about in a second because player safety decided that that was uh, fine i think like two and a half grand maximum allowable under the cba or whatever so that's what we're going to talk about next is we're going to talk about player safety the department of player safety because uh it's not the department of player safety it's the department of george perros does whatever he feels like so we're going to talk about that in a second here on lockdown blue jackets first i'm going to tell you guys about ebay motors because passion drive and patience is what brings home the winning trophy and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive ebay motors has got everything you need to maintain your vehicle level it up to peak performance from superchargers roof racks exhaust kits led headlights and more whether you're into speed power or style ebay motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you're going to find exactly what you're looking for and with ebay guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time, or you're going to get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're going to burn rubber, not cash. They've got all the parts you need at the prices you want. It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Let's talk about player safety because it's been a problem for a long time now. Um, and I think genuinely, like the problem doesn't start with George Peros because it was bad even before he was was in charge, but it was less bad, I think. And when they hired him, there was this argument of like, well, if anyone knows what a dirty hit is, it's going to be George Peros. And like the idea that just because he was a dirty player or he did a lot of, you know, questionable hits, I'm not here to debate whether or not Peros was a dirty player, but... The idea that it, it's like it's like hiring a schoolyard bully to be a hall monitor, you know. That's that's kind of the 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 best analogy that I have for it. Um, and I don't I don't understand it. Like I, I I understand the logic behind it in theory, but I can't understand how they ever thought that was going to work. If they were like, "Hey, this guy did questionable things his entire career. Now we'll let him decide whether those things are bad or not," because he clearly doesn't have the judgment to say, "Hey, that was unacceptable." Because if he knew it was unacceptable, he wouldn't have done it. You know, um, and we're kind of seeing that in terms of what player safety has been doing for the past several years which is kind of just what they want um you know i talked about this a little bit before the break david perron gets six games for his uh cross check to the face of zoom eric ranson gets one game for uh being the aggressor i think is what the is what the actual suspension was um and then ryan strom knee on knee hit for kyle connor potentially ending his season gets a fine two and a half grand, I think, or whatever it was. Um, and like, again, we're back to consistency. That's what I want from the officiating and from the discipline. Um, but I also want player safety to suspend more liberally, I think. I think right now it's, well, I can probably get away with that 
if I'm, you know, if I get a game or two for nearly murdering a guy, sure, I'll take that. Or if I'm going to get a fine, I'll take that. You know, it's, and it's also laughable when people get fined more for calling out the officiating than they do for actually doing the crimes. You know, I feel like head coaches get fined, what, 25k for calling out the officials. Someone can, again, potentially end someone's season and they get, I think $5,000 is the maximum allowed under the CBA. Depending on what, it, it's a percentage of the player's salary, but I don't remember what percentage it is. Um, but that's that, that's what it is. It's You can only be fined 20% of your salary for that game or whatever, which again, £5,000, and $5,000 is is nothing for, for these guys, especially, you know, the guys making way, way, way more. Um, but to kind of get back to my, my original point is player safety clearly isn't keeping its players safe because I feel like you see these kind of hits week in, week out, nothing gets done, but everyone promises to do something about it. And Gary Bettman's clearly not interested in it because well a he thinks that these are the best refs in the world b uh he doesn't believe that cte exists um cte is um a a it's chronic traumatic encephalopathy and it's basically what happens when your brain gets really really scrambled because you get hit in the head a bunch um and it leads to you know mental health issues it leads to physical health issues it leads to death eventually um, and you see a lot of you see it a lot more in foot. You see it in football players um, more, I think, because more football players have you know allowed their brains to be be examined by science. But you see it in NHL players as well. NHL players, they have anger issues. They have addiction issues. They have um, you know they've been hit in the head a bunch of times, and they die. And then you look at the brain afterwards, and you're like, oh, hey. CTE, probably because they got hit in the head a bunch. Gary Bettman doesn't believe in this. Um, and so he's not he's not um incentivized to cut down on hits to the head in his sport, I think. Because partially because, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity, I think, in Gary Bettman's head. And even if you're getting negative publicity, people are still paying attention to you. Um, that's kind of how I, I feel his thought process is for this. But Guys are going to get hurt. Guys do get hurt. Um, someone's going to get seriously, seriously hurt. And someone might die, you know? And that might be me being hyperbolic. That might be me being overly dramatic. But something in player safety has got to change right now. And this isn't even about Cabranson's suspension, because, like, I fully agree he probably should have been suspended. One, maybe two, maybe more games for doing what he did. Because, again, two wrongs don't make a right. You have to be held responsible for your actions. He chose to go after Nick Cousins. He was antagonized and frustrated by both Cousins and the officials. But you have to be responsible for your actions. And no one made him punch the living daylights out of Nick Cousins. You know? So, like, I'm fine with it. But when you look at suspensions in the past, you look at, like, for example, Nick Cousins' hit. That's probably a suspension. You know, you look at the hit on Patrick Laine earlier this season by Rasmus Anderson, like before games, I think it was. And then there have been almost identical hits to a bunch of different guys that have either gotten fines or more, or, you know, um, Tom Wilson got 20 games for a hit to the head a few seasons ago. Imagine how few head hits there would be if you got 20 games, you know? It's it's just it's it's frustrating and I don't like the current system, but I also have very little faith in the current system changing, especially if Batman is in charge and especially if George Peros is in charge over at DOPS. So this is all a bit of fun thought exercise, but nothing is really going to change. I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the options that could be done to improve officiating. Um, something else that I didn't mention in that section is I, ha I would love to know how often these officials are supposed to go on like training courses to re-up their qualifications. Um, because I know, 
again, the rules over here, I work for a third tier English hockey team or British hockey team, technically. We we are located in Wales. Um, and coaches and officials have to re-up their like license, so to speak, every year. Uh, do the NHL officials have to re-up their qualification every year, even if it's literally a day of going, sitting in a classroom, going through the rule book, like, I would love to know if that actually happens, because I think that is something that should happen. But um, will it? Unlikely. Uh, if it's not already happening, I don't see it happening anytime soon. So most of this was just me venting, I think, and getting frustrated and uh, talking a little bit about just the hit between Cousins and Gabranson, because I think they're not equally in the wrong, necessarily. But I think Nick Cousins absolutely should have been suspended what he did and it's frustrating that Gabranson was the only one suspended um even though I again I think he should have been but I think both players should have been suspended for their actions so that's kind of how how I feel about that um tomorrow Hayden will be back and we are gonna do uh what we were supposed to do today until all of the Gabranson stuff happened um and we're going to kind of put ourselves in the GM seat in Columbus and talk a little bit about what we would do to try and stop this slide that they're on and uh, any changes that we would make, things like that. Uh, so that'll be that'll be a fun, upbeat episode. Um, the Blue Jackets, again, they have a few days off uh, until their next game. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the season has gone so far and what we would change. I've been Jay Foster. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Jacob Foster, J-A-K-O-B-F-O-R-S-T-E-R. You can find the show at L-O underscore Blue Jackets. If you have comments, questions, criticisms, you can email us at lockedonbluejackets at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Locked on Blue Jackets is free and available on all podcast platforms and over on YouTube. And uh, yeah, thanks. Just thanks for listening in general. I don't know if, if, if this isn't your first listen or your first watch of the day, that's fine. I appreciate you anyway. Like I said, tomorrow we'll be doing uh, What If We Were the GMs of the Columbus Blue Jackets, an episode. And uh, until then, make sure you stay locked on.